This is Gen Z Finance, and on this channel, I pretty much show all of my numbers, my budgeting, my net worth, all of that fun stuff inside the software system YNAB, or you need a budget, which is what we're currently on. This particular video is going to be YNAB Tips and Tricks Part 3. In this series, I just pointed out and showed you a couple of features using YNAB that I personally implement in my budget pretty much every day and that have really helped me. So this is not a YNAB 101, this is not a how to set up YNAB and depending on your level of comfort with YNAB, you might already know all of these or you might have already, you might use them or you might have checked them out and decided they don't work for you. So I just wanna be clear so that everyone knows exactly where we are in this process. And this is not an exhaustive list of the features of YNAB, like I haven't really talked about the goals features or anything like that. These are just little things that anyone could implement in their budget that I think will really help your budget. So part three, we're gonna be talking mainly about some general features in the toolkit for YNAB Chrome extension. Part one focused on um, the budgeting and category screen and part two focused on the accounts and transactions screen side of things I guess and I did talk about toolkit for YNAB in both of those videos a couple of their features that I think really help with within both of those two sides uh, but again we're going to just talk about a little bit more general things so toolkit for YNAB like I said, is a Chrome extension. I'm not going to be going over every single feature. I will link below a video by Mapped Out Money. His name is Nick True, and he does a lot of YNAB tutorial videos, and he has a great uh, video breaking down 22 features on Toolkit for YNAB. Um, but I'm just going to talk about a couple of them here. So the first one I'm going to talk to you about is, I believe on the budget screen and it's the days of buffering metric. So what this does is it looks at how long your money might last you, your current amount of money might last you if you never earned any new income based on your average spending. So you can find it on the budget screen. It's going to be this day of buffering metric. So if I go back to my budget, you'll see up here I have age of money, which is what comes with YNAB. And this kind of looks at um, how old on average is the money that you are spending. So if you got paid, you know, it's it's pretty much looking at when was, when um, did you get this money that you're spending now? So for me, I have 138 days. So that pretty much means that the money that I'm spending this month or this week or whatever, on average, it was brought in about 138 days ago, which means that my money is kind of old. <laughs> And that's good. The higher the number that the higher this number is, the better it kind of is for you. Something to keep in mind with both of these metrics, but especially age of money, it's kind of variable. Um, my number is gonna definitely go down when I make a big debt payment payoff. Um, and really, any number past I would say 50 days is a little bit useless. Once you get to 50 days, you pretty much know that you are. Um, building, you know, a little kind of stockpile of money. YNAB wants you to get to 30 days, which is also a really good um, metric, but I kind of like to shoot for about 50 days myself personally. But So that's age of money, and that comes with the YNAB software, period. This is days of buffering. So like I said, this is looking forward. So pretty much this is saying that based on my average daily spending over the course of you know, my budgeting, um, the all of the money that I currently have in my budget, so this $17,000, would last me 865 days if I can continued on with my average daily spending and I didn't bring another cent in. So this number tends to balloon for me uh, right after I get paid. So if I input a paycheck, it will jump up to like 900 or 1,000 days. And then as soon as I move money out of that, as soon as I pay you know, bills or uh, pay student loans or anything, that number will drop down. There's, I don't really think there's a big goal to reach for this. Um, again, it is going to be inflated by your savings, how much you kind of have in your budget for savings. But it's really, I think, Days of Buffering works really well with Age of Money to give you an overall idea of how you're doing, how much you're being able to save, and um, if you're breaking that paycheck to paycheck cycle. So in general, the higher the, both of these numbers are, the better. Connected to this 
setting, this days of buffering metric, is the date of money setting and then the days of buffering metric date. So both of these settings, what they pretty much do is if you hover over the, the days, it will give you the actual date of that. So 138 days is, on average, the money I'm spending was brought in at or around March 22nd of 2020. For days of buffering, that means that I could conceivably continue to spend my average daily amount of money until December 20th, 2022. So uh, I just personally like that because it, it helps me actually, I don't know what when 138 days ago was, so it just does the math for me, so I like that. Next thing I'm going to recommend is under the general screen, this hide help button. So I'll turn this off and then save. So if I go back to my budget and refresh, it will show the hide help button or it will show the help button. So it's just this little, it's really opaque. You can barely even see it, but it does kind of break up some of what you can see on the um, far right hand side, this little inspector. And if you click on that, pretty much what it does is, you know, it gives you some Q&A links to figuring out your budget. So the more advanced you are with your budget, the more you don't need that button. And I like to keep it off so that um, I don't see it. The other thing I wanted to talk about is also down here on the general screen. And it is these, it's kind of like um, very, it's much more aesthetic but I do want to bring it up. So the first thing is this account name height. So um, option, you have the default option, compact and slim. I personally recommend the either, I recommend the compact, um, but I'll show you default and then refresh. So I was on compact, that's what mine was like, but now I'm on the default and you can just see there's that it's bigger space in between each account name. And the only thing that really does is it means I have to scroll down more to see everything and to see the add account button and to see my tracking accounts. So that's really all it does. Like I said, it's very minimal. It's, it's, an, it's, um, it's just like a personal decision and how big you want that. I prefer to keep it compact. And it's the same thing with these. These are called the navigation tabs. So those are, I'm going to switch this back to compact just so I remember. Um, here are the navigation tab heights. I have this on slim. If you put it on default, these are just going to be uh, taller and spread out your budget or your options more. Personally, I don't see how you would, why you would need it to be bigger than slim. It's really, you can still very easily read this and it's very easy to click on the correct tab that you want. Uh, but again, that is just a personal preference. So I wanted to let you guys know that that is there. And then the last aesthetic kind of thing we're going to look at is the better scroll bars. So it's right here. I have mine on tiny. And what that will show you is there are three parts on your main budget screen. So you have on the left, all of your accounts. On the middle, you have your budget. And then on the right, you have your inspector. So with each of these, you can see that you can scroll up and down on them individually. And you'll see here, I have a very tiny, thin, light gray, dark blue kind of line. And that's my scroll bar. So um, if I go to default, it's just thicker. So again, this is just personal preference. Like I said, these aren't very groundbreaking um, features, but aesthetically, I think it's, see so you have this dark gray, big thing. So personal preference, but definitely I really recommend that you check out this area of the settings in YNAP for Toolkit and really play around with what's gonna make your budget look better for you. The other thing I highly recommend that you guys turn on is this Toolkit Reports. You have to have this in my personal opinion. So just add, just turn that on We'll save these. I'll refresh so that those ugly scroll bars are gone. And then I'll go to my toolkit reports tab um, and go over some of these toolkit reports. So 
There are three main reports that come with YNAB, income versus expenses, net worth, and then spending by categories or spending trends by categories. So the toolkit reports have, ha, do, they come with, it has, let's see, it's now at seven reports and it, three of them are the same. So it, it comes with the net worth report. It's a little bit different because it comes, the net worth report has the red shading for when you have a negative net worth and then this light yellow kind of blue shading when you have a positive net worth. And it won't show you the percentage of growth, which the YNAB report does. Um, it has the spending by category report, which is great. And then it also has the income versus expenses report that YNAB has. It's just a little bit different aesthetically. Um, the great thing that it kind of repeats these reports and something that I do personally is I tend to keep the toolkit reports the date range is all dates that I've been using this budget using YNAB. So for me, that's February 2019 through August 2020. And if I go to my YNAB report, you'll see that these are all just for the year of 2020. So I like to kind of keep it like this where I have the toolkit reports for all dates. Because I know if I want to look at, I just like to have it keyed up like that so that I can see totally what my totals are for everything and then if I want to compare what my totals are for you know this entire year and a half that I've been using it versus just 2020 I can easily go back and forth to YNAB reports and toolkit reports. So that's something to keep in mind since you do kind of get several of these reports twice, duplications of them. How do you want to set up your reports? You can also change okay in my um, toolkit reports maybe I don't want to look at any of my tracking accounts Maybe I only want to look at my on budget accounts. That's totally fine. And you can just set that by um, clicking on or off all of these accounts. And that's another way that you can contrast these two reports. So I think that's really cool. The other reports in toolkit um, is this inflow and outflow cat um, report. To be honest, this is one of their nearest reports and it's not something that I really use or find that helpful. If anything, it kind of confuses me more than helps. But um, if you're really an analytical person and um, this report makes sense to you, this is a great report that you can definitely check out. We have the spending by category report, which is again a duplication of the report that's that comes with YNAB. And then they also give you a spending by payee report. So instead of organizing this based on what your biggest categories are, they're going to organize this based on what payees are you paying the most amount of money to. And I think this is really great because depending on how you set up your payees and all of that, it's going to allow you to see, right, the spending by category is going to group the, all of your categories by their master groups. Uh, so you won't be able to see what are my biggest independent categories unless you click into the master group and then see the breakdown. But spending by payee might be able to give you an idea of what your biggest singular categories are. For instance, my payee transfer to plus parent group A is connected to one category and that one category is parent plus group A category. For instance, gas station, which is in my top 10 payees, is connected to one category group, which for me is gas. I mean, it, your payees might not be connected to just one category group for you, and that's totally fine, but it does, I think, it can give you that kind of idea of what are your biggest, you know, 25 categories. Amazon, Amazon is connected to a lot of my categories, so it's not as helpful for that, but Amazon is definitely, um, obviously, a payee or a, a store that I visit often. And actually, let's update this because this is saying February 2019 to February 2020. If I just click on all dates, yep. See, Amazon has now jumped up quite a bit because I've been spending more at Amazon. So uh, playing with the spending by payee report is really interesting. It can give you a lot of great insights. If you click on a specific payee, you'll see all of your transactions for that. We've already talked about the income versus expenses. Income breakdown is one of my favorite reports. Um, it just takes all of your sources of income for that date range and then tells you exactly how much you've spent. 
And one of the great things about this, and a lot of people have this issue with YNAB, is they're like, okay, I can't really track how much I'm saving because YNAB views these transactions as, you know, money coming in and out. And if you're saving money and keeping it in your savings account, it's not going to show up in any category unless you keep your savings off budget in a tracking account. But what this report does is it gives you this net gain category where this is everything that's come into your budget that you have not yet spent. So it's not perfect because maybe you just got paid yesterday and you just haven't, you know, paid the mortgage yet for this month or whatever it is. But this does give you a general idea. So you can see my net gain is $17,722.13. That's everything that I have not spent, has not left my on budget accounts, my checking account or my savings account or my cash um, since I started. And co not coincidentally, this is part of the report, this is how you kind of know that your numbers are accurate. The net gain, $17,722.13, is the, the sum of my checking, savings, cash, and Venmo. So, um, if I look at just this year for 2020, that net gain actually increased, is now, f I'm pretty much saving around 50% of my income so far this year that I just have not spent yet. So this is a really great report, I highly recommend. And then the final report, which is another one that I love, is the balance over time report. So this looks at individual account balances and you can select which ones you want to look at and then it will just show you what those balances have done, changes in those balances since you started. So if you want to focus specifically on your credit cards and maybe your loans, so I'll just select my loans and my credit cards. You can see here's the zero balance right here. Um, this purple one is my Chase credit card. That blue one is my Discover credit card. And then this orange one is my uh, student loan that I still have not had much progress on yet. Um, so maybe you want to just track your credit card balances um, or you want to specifically track just your checking account and see, you know, how much is that varying and where are you kind of keeping it. You can see my checking account, the highest it had ever really had on it at one point was about $5,000 and then I immediately transferred a boatload of that out um, to my savings account. And so I try to keep my checking account, um, I really ideally like to keep it below 3000 which I think my report shows that a lot of times whenever I have a any money above 3000 it usually drops quite a bit because I'm transferring money out. Um, but I think this is a really cool, really interesting report. You can do it for, like I said, your you want to do it for your 401k and just see how that's growing and that's just very nice and I guess encouraging to see. So um, the toolkit reports are probably the best thing about toolkit for YNAB for me personally. I love a lot of the features. Like I said, I had a part one and part two. If you haven't seen that, definitely go check that out because it's going to get into some more specific toolkit options that are going to uh, really help you when you're actually budgeting. And most of these toolkit for YNAB options that I showed you today were a little bit more aesthetic or general. And then the toolkit reports that we went over. So that's it for me. I hope you guys enjoyed this video. I've been meaning to put it up for a very long time. Um, one of the previous things that I really liked they had for toolkit for YNAB was the ability to let you um, edit your inspector with and all of that. But now YNAB has that capability for you built in. So I, I didn't need to talk about that. Um, and that was one of the reasons that I was waiting to post this video because that ability went away in Toolkit for YNAB as YNAB was rolling out their new update. So that's it for me. Hope you guys liked this video. Next week I should be putting up my first bi-weekly paycheck for August and potentially some other videos going over gross paycheck tracking or PTO tracking. Um, and those should be coming up later this month. Thank you guys so much for watching. I hope you guys are staying safe and healthy and have a good day.